Welcome everyone here in New York and uh, a very warm welcome to our friends, our students in uh, Beirut and also our friends in, in Texas. Uh, so I think it's a great opportunity to kick off today uh, with this uh, program here, the AUB uh, New York uh, Beirut Exchange. And we are very honored, we from the Food Security Program, that we can kick it off. and. Um, Thanks to the leadership of uh, President Khoury, who always asks us to be bold. Um, we're very pleased to, to be bold here because we can really, really say that food security is one of the key issues. And, and I'd like to also mention uh, thanks to the leadership, the intellectual leadership of uh, the former Dean, uh, Professor Awalla, uh, this program exists. And this is very extraordinary that we look at, at a range of topics. We're very interdisciplinary. We have economists working for us. We've got uh, rural um, experts. We've got nutrition experts working uh, in, in the sphere of this program. So it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, and I would like to seize this opportunity to make a few key points. And I need to ask you to sort of uh, move the uh, screen around, because otherwise I will be. <coughs> No, nothing happens. You if see, you it's the next, yeah. it works better in Beirut. So New York is. Uh, uh, I will, I will, I will uh, navigate for you. Anyway, so please, yeah, please. Uh, so the first question is, why is food security, I would call it uh, a make it or break it uh, situation in in the Arab world? Um, look at this slide. I think everything has to start with demography. And in the Middle East and North Africa, and the numbers we've used here include um, not only uh, about some external uh, countries in the region, it includes Mauritania, uh, Sudan, then North Africa, uh, the Gulf states, uh, in this case, uh, Turkey and Iran as well. And this region will grow to over a billion people by the end of the century. If you compare it to Europe, which is a dwarf uh, compared to, to this region, or will be a dwarf, um, then it's, it's very, very interesting. I'm sure you all remember the geopolitical games that were played, you know, Operation Ajax in the 1950s. If we look back you know, in the 1950s, uh, really the Arab world, or the, the Middle East and North Africa, was, was, was quite small compared to Europe. And this will turn around in the next 80 years. And the make it, oh sorry, the break even uh, point will be reached in 2020 when we, when we will see uh, a similar number of people in uh, the Middle East and North Africa and in Europe. And what will unfollow is, or unfold, is um, a very new picture. And obviously, these people will need to be fed. And that's a mega challenge. Right now, the Arab world is one of the most food import dependent regions in the world. Up to 80% of food is imported. Um, Lebanon is one of the countries that imports uh, most of its food. Um, and the problem is it cannot produce more because domestic production is limited in the case of Lebanon because of land shortages, but also water uh, issues, water scarcity. Lebanon is doing a lot better than, than, than other countries like Jordan or Egypt, but uh, Lebanon is similarly affected. Um, and this food import dependency may, or I wouldn't say may, but will pose development challenges to the region. And who will be mostly affected are rural areas where farmers live, where people live who sometimes have a dollar or two to spare or as income per day. So the consequence we are expecting is more urbanization. And I think in this you know, first few comments, I've mentioned a few mega topics around the world, the UN here in New York, everyone is working on it, urbanization, food security, water, uh, people are looking at environmental degradation, people are looking at trade issues. So the Arab world will be one of the core regions in the world that is going to, to see uh, the problems unfolding uh, in its in its uh, 
in its region. Can I have the next slide, please? And let me give you a few reasons why you know, there, there are these problems. Look at you know, this slide here. This is agricultural suitability. And agricultural suitability is limited except for in actually Lebanon in the, in the Fertile Crescent, from uh, you know, stretching from uh, Israel, Palestine, up to uh, uh, Iraq and, and to a certain extent Iran. Turkey is, uh, has agricultural suitability and Northern Africa. But the other countries have very limited agricultural um, suitabilities, in particular uh, countries which are already very poor, Yemen. Uh, and the other very important one is Egypt. Egypt's agricultural suitability is um, challenging, in particular in light of, of population growth. Because if we look at um, population growth from a, from a country perspective, and Egypt with currently 90 million will grow to 200 million in, in 2080, uh, 2100. Sudan, currently around 30 million, will grow to uh, over 130 million. So 330 million in the, in the Nile Basin, in the Arab part of the Nile Basin, fully dependent on the river, on the Nile, and on groundwater. Well, that's a mega, mega challenge. So please let me have the slide on, on water constraints. As you can see here, water constraints are the key driving factor. Again, we have you know, the best regions are in, uh, in North Africa, in Morocco, Nigeria. Um, Turkey is doing quite well. Some areas, you know, Lebanon still has, has, has a potential, but the rest of the region is very, very challenged. And this will only intensify as a result of climate change, when in particular Iran will get more, more dry, when uh, Northern Africa will be very negatively hit. So water, as um, a colleague in the US Department of State said, is in fact the key issue of climate change, because climate change is another form of water management in the future. And in the Middle East and North Africa, this will be uh, the core challenge, together with land degradation. Please, next slide. And land degradation shows that uh, due to heavy irrigation practices, land is already quite saline. Look at Egypt once again in our delta. Um, it, it's not so easy to, to get more out of, out of the soil because of uh, heavy, heavy use of, of soils in the past. Uh, same applies to the Euphrates and Tigris, as you can see um, on the right-hand side, and uh, in, in parts of Northern Africa as well. So, we have a challenge in terms of land degradation. And therefore, we might be extremely lucky to overcome those uh, epic environmental challenges. Um, but I personally believe one of the results of the next few years, next slide please, will be a continuous trend in terms of people moving to cities. Um, if you have water scarcity in the countryside, if land is already quite degraded, and uh, if cities are also expanding because more people will be, will be born and more people need to find jobs, then cities will grow. And therefore, what is going to, to, to happen is um, that uh, we need to find ways to uh, absorb people in the, in the cities around the region, um, finding jobs, finding food. And this has a number of challenges, but also opportunities. A consequence of another epic scale is the food production and consumption. Um, well, can't see much. Um, at present, we can, uh, we can see that uh, food consumption and, uh, and production do not add up. Um, there's a gap which is only going to intensify. What we uh, what we see is that uh, over the coming years, this gap will, will only increase, and and therefore uh, it's likely that the Arab world will be more dependent on on the world market. And this world market is also challenging. The world market will be mainly North America, Russia, to a certain extent, Australia, and perhaps uh, some commodities can also be imported from from Sub-Saharan Africa. However, Sub-Saharan Africa needs to feed itself because it will also grow to, to 4 billion people uh, by 2100. So, while well, the Middle East will double, um, 
Sub-Sahara Sub Africa, it's to a certain extent, neighboring region will um, grow four times in, in population size. So therefore, trade dependency has significant impacts on economic development paths. If, as we've seen in the past, uh, a country is dependent on, say, the United States of America, it might have uh, foreign policy implications, domestic policy implications. Um, back in the days of Nasser, um, the Americans managed to uh, call um, Nasser back into the Western camp through food, because they said, well, you know, if you, uh, um, if you want to survive politically, then you need food imports, and they offered uh, uh, Nasser more or less free food, because the Egyptian pound didn't, wasn't floated on the world market back in the days. So therefore, uh, the Americans didn't have any use of um, uh, or with the, the Egyptian pound. So therefore, uh, they managed to just provide free wheat to the Egyptian uh, market and therefore bought Nasser's allegiance. That was in the 1960s. In the 1970s, we saw the OPEC crisis, and there was a very famous song which was called No More Food If No Crude, a country song. I don't want to <laughs> play it to you now, but uh, back in the 1970s, when the OPEC country said, you, we do not want you to uh, dismiss the Palestinian cause, uh, we would like to fight for our brothers and sisters in, in, in Palestine, uh, the Americans actually threatened not to uh, deliver food anymore uh, because of um, the, the uh, oil crisis uh, that unfolded. Um, and then nothing happened, uh, fortunately, but then in the 1980s when the Russians invaded Afghanistan, the Americans actually imposed a food export ban on, uh, on Russia, the Soviet Union back in the days, and this led to great uh, calamity amongst Arab countries. One reason for it, or one outcome of uh, the food politics in the 1970s and 80s, was the unsustainable wheat production program by the Saudi government in the desert which has now been faded out. But the Saudis were very, very nervous because again, if you're dependent on the world market, what's going to happen is you may not be able to pursue your favored policy choices. You will have to listen to other uh, leaders around the world. And right now, what we can already see is it's not only America, it's a strong player in the weed of food politics in the region, but it's also uh, President Putin who frequently uh, engages with Russia or with Egypt on, on topics such as uh, wheat supply. Same, similar uh, issues have been discussed with Syria. So Russia is a new player, not only in terms of its military, but also in terms of its, its uh, um, availability of, of, of wheat, which can be distributed to, to Arab countries. So. This is one topic which is of great importance. It's, it's wheat. Next slide, please. As you can see here, these are you know, different uh, production and consumption of, of commodities. Um, problem is actually cereals, not so much uh, commodities uh, such as uh, you know, fruits and vegetables, but uh, commodities which, which need to be imported, which need to be, which need to be imported from countries with vast land sizes, such as um, in. in Eurasia or in the Americas. Um, and what happens if there is not enough food? This is very well explained on the next slide. Please. Um, price spikes and political unrest. Um, I, I really like this slide because it explains a lot of things. Back in 2007 or 8, we had a period of uh, spiking food prices around the world, but uh, particularly uh, developing countries were hit. But, as you can see here, the first food price spike was sort of mild. People were, of course, uh, very badly hit, but uh, it didn't lead to immediate uh, unrest. However, the second price spikes, 2010-11, these price spikes caused immense uh, outbreak of, of political unrest around the world, in particular also in the Arab world. I'm not saying that the Arab Spring has been caused by food price spikes, certainly not. But the Arab Spring has certainly an element of 
uh, food price issues and, and, and food availability and, and food security issues. So therefore, if you do not pay attention to your food supply, uh, you might not survive in government. I think that's a very important and, and, and big issue. Um, the next topic, uh, next slide please, is something which is called hidden hunger. You know, people may be fed quantitatively, but there's a, loom, a looming threat of undernutrition. This slide shows that um, protein security, I'll call it that way, uh, is not fully achieved in, in the Arab world because people cannot really uh, rely on uh, sufficient uh, protein sources. In particular, the countryside is badly affected due to um, high levels of rural poverty, in particular in uh, uh, pastoral areas, in dryland mixed areas, and in highland mixed areas, where poor farmers uh, live on uh, a few dollars a day. Irrigated areas are doing better, but as I told you, the problem is we do not have sufficient water resources to, to expand this. So, is it all doom and gloom? That's, and what can academia do? I think we can do a lot. I think there are a lot of opportunities that will arise in the next few years, in particular in, uh, through the support of the European Union. The European Union is going to put up its biggest uh, research program uh, in the next uh, 10 years with 60 million euros a year just looking at water and food research to partner Mediterranean countries uh, on issues that affect them such as you know finding ways to achieve water and food security. Uh, we have fortunately also American support in the region mainly more for you know, practical development uh, areas but <coughs> I think um, there are great opportunities for academics to uh, to work together. And I actually, I can't read this slide at all, so you can keep it closer. We need to ask you in New York if you can reload your slides in Beirut. They seem to have frozen. Can you uh, pull the slideshow down and put it back up, then, please? Sure. Hold then. Are you still on? Can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we can hear you, but if you can stop sharing and then share again. Yeah, I know. Blue jeans crashed on my side. Uh, one more disconnect. The phone disconnect. So maybe Mark, you can just. So what are the key issues? What can academia do? What is it all doom and gloom? And uh, I don't think so. First of all, the MENA region's development choices uh, will decide upon the future. One opportunity is to adapt climate or to, to find ways to in, introduce adapted um, climate smart diets. So, for example, increasing uh, uh, the consumption of uh, environmentally and healthy foods, such as lentils and legumes, uh, less red meats, which is very water intensive. Um, another opportunity is to identify strategic import uh, roosters, maybe through uh, an Arab trader, to uh, really pool the Arab world's opportunities on the global market. At the moment, it's um, quite patchy. Every country or every country like Lebanon, for example, is, is very a very small player on the world market. And as you can imagine, other countries like Qatar are doing even worse. And Another option and uh, important opportunity is to identify creative production solutions under marginal conditions, for example, looking at dryland agriculture, how to upscale it, but also 
looking at ways to use the city more productively, urban agriculture, for example, urban food systems. But most importantly, I think what is needed is strategic plans, um, and we need a new generation of change makers, not only in government, but also in the private sector that address the topic and understand where are the opportunities and how uh, food security or the food security predicament of um, the early days of the 21st century can be turned into an opportunity uh, over the next few decades to find peace and prosperity and collaboration in this region uh, between countries and uh, societies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. So talking of uh, creative ideas, uh, new strategic solutions and change makers, we will shift to our next speaker, who is Dr. Uh, Rabia Mahtar, who, Mahtar, who is in uh, Texas. Uh, he is a research professor at Texas A&M University, an expert on the water energy food nexus, and is the incoming dean of AUB's Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences. And he will speak to us for about uh, nine, 10 minutes, giving us his perspective on uh, the, the broader context of these issues and possibly what uh, universities like AUB and others uh, can do about it. So, uh, Dr. Rabia, uh, Adam Sandland, go ahead. Shukran, uh, Good morning, New York. Uh, good afternoon, Beirut, and uh, good day, everyone in between. <laughs> thank you for uh, the kind introduction, and uh, thank you. Uh, Martin, for a comprehensive overview, uh, I would uh, build on what Martin mentioned, but I'd like you to read and ponder on the outlook. Uh, uh, the, uh, Martin has, has really put a very comprehensive uh, layers that I call uh, systems. So the food system is part of a bigger system of systems, a complex mosaic of interactions that my intervention will highlight that, and I also would build on what Martin mentioned in terms of what specifics the scientific community can offer. And I'd like to highlight one aspect which is local. Unlike technology, where you can take an iPhone and take it anywhere in the world and it will work, uh, natural resource system is about localizing the knowledge. And I would, would emphasize that a lot of the knowledge that we uh, need to uh, present with a very narrow buffer in terms of resource scarcity is about local knowledge. Next slide. I can't see the slide. Please, next slide. Thank you. This slide highlights a very important element, which is the fact that with the business as usual, we are expecting by 2050 an increase in water resources demand, basically building on what Martin has mentioned. We also will be experiencing an increase in the food demand and on the energy demand. So there is an increase in the bubble with the limited resources available at hand. The other dimension that I'd like to mention here is the interconnectedness will, as such, any strategy that needs to be made for the food security must include the implications on water, energy, and vice versa, the implications of the shortages in water and energy prices and availability of the food system. So we must look at these as an interconnected systems of system for us to really do sustainable interventions for the future. Next. So I'd like to define the water energy food system as an interconnected primary resources of water, energy, and food. It's a system that allows us to look at interlinkages, hotspots, and trade-offs. It will also allow us to build on the knowledge that we have in these three disciplines and allow for a more sustainable interventions for the future. It is a system that allows for tail kind of uh, pinpointing hotspots for future interventions and for the trade-off moving forward. It builds on the water productivity, energy efficiency, 
and integrated water resources management. Next. There were a couple of slides that were missing, but I would, uh, I, I would uh, mention. Uh, Rabia, go ahead and, and That's okay. mention the slides that were not there. Just tell us verbally the key points that are important about them. Absolutely. I, as I mentioned earlier, there are two key points in this complex food supply chain system. The first one is the interconnectedness that I just sh shared with you. So building any resilience to the food security, we must acknowledge the inherent interconnections between water, energy, and food. The other is developing localized solutions, and Martin just mentioned a few of those. So in the water food arena, I'd like to pinpoint that the majority of our food is produced under dry land agriculture. So, and at the moment, the blue water is what the water managers actually discuss and highlight. Well, the fact is, for our countries, for our region in the MENA, more than the blue water, we have a green water space, which is the space in which water is stored in the dry, in the, in the uh, battle zone, be responsible for food production. And at the moment, that space is not very well understood. So trying to understand the dynamics of this whole water interaction and how do you understand that dynamics and improve the productivity of dry land agriculture with local technologies is very, very important. Land breeding plays a big role. And I'd like to highlight the fact that a lot of our wastewater is not being used. Martin mentioned the expansion of the city. That constitutes a huge challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity where a lot of the wastewater can be recycled into the system and be used for food production. The issue is there is technology and technology and energy prices. So how can we make a targeted treatment technology that will target certain elements of that wastewater and recycle it back into a affordable technologies for reuse for agriculture. There are many other technologies that the uh, academic community can focus on. However, we, as I mentioned earlier, we need to develop the local know-how and build on local knowledge in which that bridge, bridging the gap between the supply. Thank you so much, and I'll be happy to entertain questions later. Thank you, Rabia. We will definitely come back to you with uh, questions, and we will move on to the third speaker, but let me just remind uh, people who are um, following us possibly on, um, on the internet that if anybody wants to ask a question, you can do it to, um, through the uh, webs, through the um, Twitter at, at AUB under slash NYO, AUB under slash NYO for New York office. Uh, or you can email a freeland, freeland at aub.edu. So our third speaker in Beirut is Rachel Ann Bon, who is an instructor and food security program coordinator in the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences. And uh, Rachel will give us uh, insights into what the program uh, at the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences is actually attempting to achieve and what makes it um, so uh, relevant and unique uh, in the interdisciplinary nature of the research topics that they're undertaking. And this will bring us back in the question and answer period to issues of, so we know now what are the challenges, we know the threats, we know the, the problems, so so. Who, who, do, who do we turn to for the solutions? Uh, governments, international aid, uh, private sector, farming communities, uh, universities that can bring all these things together. Uh, Rachel will give us some insights into what's actually happening now uh, at AUB. So, Rachel, Alan, and Faddali, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, 
to pick up on that, um, I wanted to open up with just telling you a bit about how the program came into being, then focusing on what's happening in terms of teaching, and then we'll talk a bit about our research efforts. So the food security program uh, came about formally in a res as a response to the global food crisis of 2007-8, and then again in 2011 in the Arab Spring. And it was conceptualized with a lot of input from faculty members here at the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences, including Dr. Fala Hamedi. As well as other contributors and external experts who also weighed in on the design and putting us in the space. Because we are the first and to our knowledge only program that deals with these issues of food security in the MENA region at the graduate level um, as a formal program. Uh, the program, while it's housed at FAFS, is actually overseen by a committee that also draws from uh, experts outside of the faculty as well and across, across the university. As for teaching, our approach is really interdisciplinary. We draw on relevant expertise that corresponds to the multiple dimensions of food security. When we talk about availability, that's largely through agricultural production or natural resource management. In terms of access, we have contributors for We can't hear you, Rachel. In agriculture and agribusiness, in nutrition, even in international affairs and Middle Eastern studies. And that interdisciplinary approach, both from the students, from the faculty, and our course selection, and the idea is that we're reflecting the complexity of the concept of food security. So we don't focus solely on agricultural production. While it's very important, we're trying to expand the understanding beyond what it has been perhaps traditionally among policy circles or in certain government policies in the MENA region. Uh, to let you coming up from this, our research efforts, the diversity of research spans the range of faculty member expertise. So for example, in the area of agricultural production or livestock systems, we see work that reflects uh, the importance of these systems in the region, particularly in marginal lands that aren't necessarily suited to very wide uh, intensive crop cultivation. Dr. Hamidi has done a lot of work on livestock and food security in the Arab region. Um, Dr. Zaher Bashur uh, and Dr. Todd also all contributed to a recent volume that was published earlier this year on looking at agricultural and food production in, and sustainability of those in the region in particular. We have folks working on natural resource management, particularly water scarcity, and that includes work done by Dr. Coilers as well as Dr. Jaffa, um, looking at uh, implications for irrigation systems in the region. We have a lot of work. Um, a big note has been in the nutrition security space, particularly seeking to understand food and nutrition security, both among Lebanese host communities and within the Syrian refugee population, which has been such a focus of attention in the region in the past years. And a lot of that work is coming, uh, it's been led by Dr. Zoma and Hwala, um, as well as contributions from others. Agriculture and conflict, which is a kind of variant on that theme, has also uh, taken up a lot of time and attention of some of our faculty members, whether they're formally with the program or working outside. Um, so Dr. Zadeh, who sits on the high-level panel of experts, has contributed, um, several of us have contributed to a volume on conflict and crisis in agriculture that will be published in 2018. Uh, Dr. Martin Yellow from the Rural Community Development Program has done a lot of work on food riots. There's work that looks uh, in terms of landscape or geographic or uh, focus. Again, Dr. Jaffa's work, but also the work of uh, Dr. Zadeh. Then there's work on ag econ or access to food. In sum, all of these, these research efforts are seeking to both fill gaps in the knowledge that exists in the region, particularly when we compare the region to developing countries or other parts of the developing world. And it's not, excuse me, developed countries or other parts of the developing world. It's not to say that the knowledge is not there, it's that maybe it hasn't been codified or published or maybe it hasn't been formally collected. So a lot of our work is trying to, to fill that gap. For example, you see that in our efforts, our collaborative efforts to make just data available through a partnership with the International Food Policy Research Institute. That's one very visible way. Uh, elsewhere, intervention-based research is seeking to improve food security outcomes within the region. And we see this in efforts, for example, community kitchens work or the urban agriculture work that's been done in tandem with the uh, ESDU. 
And finally, one thing to note is that when we say interdisciplinary research, we are increasingly seeing teams that are drawing on experts from different disciplines. So, for example, sustainable food systems requires people who have a range of expertise up and down the value chain, even reaching consumers. And so we're starting to see more sort of farm-to-fork style proposals and work and efforts. I guess I would leave it with that, but we're happy to answer questions. And we have many of the contributing uh, faculty members around the table here in Beirut as well. Uh, thank you, Rachel, and thank you for uh, all the people in, uh, in Beirut. So uh, we've had quite a, a few dimensions of this issue presented to us uh, in quite uh, striking form. Um, we have with us, I believe, Dr. Tony Coleman. Yeah. Is Tony here? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Coleman is uh, now with the Earth Institute at Columbia University. He also holds positions in South Africa and in uh, in the United Kingdom, and uh, we'd like to give him the opportunity to make a quick comment and ask maybe the first question about these issues from, from his perspective. Yes. Um, uh, can I start by paying tribute to the American University of Beirut? I was there last December at a Rebuilding Health uh, conference, uh, Rebuilding Health Post-Conflict. Post um, it's an amazing campus, amazing group of people, and uh, I look forward to returning if I'm invited again in the future. Uh, and, uh, I think, uh, just say my background is as a, uh, a former um, Member of Parliament, Minister of the Blair Government, so I've sort of reinvented myself as an academic. Uh, my question is about water, uh, which is the big issue which I concentrate on, and water scarcity. And we are only here um, a few hundred yards from the United Nations. Can I ask the uh, two people who are online and, the, and Martin, who is here, who I admire his work very much, um, the extent to which the UN uh, Convention on Shared Water Courses, uh, both in surface water and potentially in groundwater, is an area of research that uh, he and the other two uh, people who are online have uh, moved on, whether they are uh, feeling this is an area which is underdeveloped in terms of looking at the issues we are discussing today on food security, both in North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, it's an area where I work in at the University of Cape Town, where there is very great activity there in shared water. Uh, and even in the apartheid years, there was a view to be able to, to have that as a common ground to ensure there were food security. So the question is, uh, to, to what extent is the UN uh, uh, Convention on Water Courses, which is now in force, over 40 countries have ratified, uh, and a, 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 the view, if you like, in terms of how the Groundwater Convention could move forward. I think it would be an excellent area for there to be cooperation between all the states in the region. Thank you. Martin, do you want to start? With, <clears throat> with great pleasure. Thank you very much, Tony, for a, a very important topic, the transboundary water relations of the region. The three food bowls, the Nile, the Euphrates and Tigris, and the Jordan River Basin are not exclusively Arab, as we know. I mean, just look at the Euphrates and Tigris. It's, uh, Turkey is the, what is called the water hegemon in, in, the, in the literature. Um, they've built dams. They've created, um, in fact, a new reality by also expanding... Uh, their agricultural uh, uh, production size by 1.8 million hectares, and they're depriving the countries in uh, downstream, uh, the Euphrates uh, and Tigris, of uh, access to water and water quality. So Syria and Iraq are negatively affected by the choices that have been made by, by Turkey. Uh, the same applies, a very famous case is obviously the, the Jordan uh, uh, River Basin, we see Israel as the as the water hegemon in the in the literature, and we see Jordan and the Palestinians having no access uh, or very limited access to water resources, uh, and then we see the Nile Basin and the Nile Basin I mentioned it's fascinating. We see uh, exploding populations in the in the next eighty years, and interestingly uh, they have nothing but the river and some groundwater, and Ethiopia, which is increasingly becoming uh, in control of the of the Nile, in particular of the Blue Nile, uh, is is also creating new realities by building building dams and by uh, possibly expanding uh, irrigation schemes. So the Arab world depends on 
non-Arab countries to secure its at least surface water future. And Tony, your question couldn't be more uh, accurate. Uh, the UN Water uh, Transboundary Water Convention has not been signed by any Arab country, and, uh, and not by Turkey, and not by Ethiopia, not by Uganda, so it's not uh, just uh, the Arab world, and certainly also not by Israel. So uh, we, we do find a situation that the United Nations can play a very important role, bringing in international law, bringing in opportunities to make countries to collaborate who normally don't talk to each other. That's the key issue, and I think it's a fascinating issue. And from New York, from the city which has brought uh, international co uh, cooperation uh, into life, it's, it's um, a brilliant topic. It's a brilliant research topic for students from you know, any background to, to look at. So um, thank you very much for this question. Uh, maybe Rabia, would you like to add something to, to this point? Yes, Rabia, I'd like to also ask you to comment on, from your experience, <clears throat> can universities bring the knowledge that they generate, especially the interdisciplinary knowledge, bring it to bear on policy makers? What the link between university research and policy making in the Arab world or in other places, do you see opportunities for this? And is this something you might want to look at as you uh, take on the deanship of the faculty at AUB? <clears throat> the, of the issue that reminds me I was muted so let me uh, repeat uh, my first <laughs> sentence Tony mentioned something very significant uh, with the transboundary and I would like even to uh, amplify that with the virtual water issues most of the countries in the region heavily rely on imported food and with the climate change and with the zone shifting and with the threats to the local food production in the countries that we are importing from, that's going to become even a, a much more significant issue. When we start looking at the price local produced water and the impact on the local production, that's going to create additional risk to the MENA region in terms of the food security. So let me go back and, and build on what, uh, what Rami had mentioned and build on what I did talk about earlier, which is localizing water and food security issues and what can be done to really build on that in terms of the efficiencies and moving away. We need a different paradigm in our production system. And that's what I think AUB and, and Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences at AUB, with the help of other units at AUB can help move the region into a different paradigm and break that cycle of interdependencies and create what I call a zone of synergies with the water energy food as the catalyst for that. Examples would be, at the moment, we don't value water, we don't value land, we don't value energy in our production system. So how do we bring these values into what being looking at from efficiency into productivity zone, where we look at water reuse, where we look at reducing food waste, where we look at reducing the uh, footprint that current production system has, where we look at the reducing the energy footprint for our production, and we look at the, the, the reducing the energy for water interdependencies. A new paradigm is needed to localize water and water and food security in the region, and I think AUB and the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences could be the catalyst for that change. And I think we have an opportunity there to make that impact and to increase the resilience of local communities, despite all of these challenges that we see around us. Thank you. Uh, Rachel and the colleagues in Beirut, would any of you like to comment on that issue? Rachel, can you hear us? We can. Uh, just uh, test this. Thank you. I'm uh, Hadi Jafar from the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences. I work in uh, water issues and food in the region. Um, 
I would like to start by uh, thanking uh, all the organizers for this very important event which is uh, highlighting the importance of uh, the food security program at the American University of Beirut. And I think this program is, um, has been established at the right place. It's the Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences. And by that, I would build on uh, what, what has been mentioned about the importance of tapping into local knowledge and also onto the different expertise that uh, the faculty enjoys in terms of all uh, the themes of water, uh, of food, and hopefully we tap into more uh, energy experts with uh, other faculties at AUB. Um, the issue of food security in the region is really um, of paramount importance, and uh, this has been highlighted uh, with uh, with the presentations that we've seen today, and um, there's nothing much to add on that except that we have also to include the economics and um, uh, food production is not enough. Of course, we are one of the most actually we are the most water scarce uh, countries in the world. Uh, we import most of our food. Uh, more than 60% of our surface water comes from outside our boundaries. So we are even dependent on external water for, for production if we want to produce and provide for our security. Um, but again, the economics, uh, the actual economic situation of the countries is not helping. I would like to give the example of um, two countries in the Nina region. Um, one is Tunis, who is the uh, third or second uh, biggest producer of olives in the world. Uh, but it is food insecure and the economy is not doing great. And if you take um, the United Arab Emirates, which does not produce any food, it's uh, ranked at the most food secure country in the region. And um, uh, this is, uh, and e even though it had the major population increase in the 1960s, the United Arab Emirates counted 92,000 uh, people, now it's, it's counting 9.2 million. And still it's one of the most uh, food secure regions uh, or countries in the, uh, in the area. So, um, so the economic importance of, um, you know, of uh, having access to food, uh, people have to afford the food uh, to buy it. Um, this is uh, one thing that, um, you know, and, and we have uh, we have agriculture economics professors at, at the university at, uh, at the faculty who can also feed into that. Um, I think this is uh, all what I wanted to say now, and I'd leave it to other colleagues who, uh, who would like to talk. Thank you very much. I think Martin, go ahead. I think when we thank you very much, Hadi, for your very important uh, contribution. Hadi Jafar is uh, first of all uh, a great scholar, great colleague, but he's uh, recently conducted what I believe one of the most interesting studies that uh, have been carried out in the water and food space. He looks at how um, Daesh, the Islamic State uh, in the in the Levant, uh, has been able to capitalize on agriculture, on food. Uh, in order to obtain uh, to obtain forex, I think this is an exciting research field. We have never, you know, many people have been able to do this. And and Hadi, with um, our colleague Eckhard Verts in Barcelona, uh, has shown through uh, remote sensing uh, activities research um, how to to uh, understand different uh, uh, patterns in areas where we have very little knowledge on. And it also shows the importance of agriculture in, in places uh, such as Iraq and, and Syria. So uh, thank you very much for your contribution. And uh, I hope uh, his work uh, is, uh, will, will continue to... to uh, uh, I'm Nouvan Dazir. I'm Dean Emeritus in the faculty. And I would like to add my voice to have these... Uh, comments in relation to thanking the organizers uh, of this very important uh, workshop. Uh, I uh, wanted to ask Martin to start with. Uh, he presented uh, a lot of uh, good information for us and particularly in relation to the problems and challenges of food security in the region. 
Uh, but when it came to the last slides, uh, which I think was very important, that is the role of academia in uh, at least providing some solutions, uh, unfortunately we could not read the slides. <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe, maybe he could sleep us a little bit more. And then uh, maybe Rabia would also like to add on the role of academia. In other words, I can understand the, the research, I can understand the teaching, uh, but what else can universities do in the region to provide some solutions to food security? I know uh, if we can have a magic stick and stop all the turbulence and the wars, uh, and what have you in this region, we would be moving a great deal forward in relation to food security. But at the present time, we are not able to do that. So what can universities do to uh, at least alleviate the transient problems that we are having in food insecurity? Thank you. And then Rabia. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm sorry that the last slide didn't, didn't come through. Um, I mentioned that uh, we need to look at, at three points. First of all, looking at adapted uh, diets, climate-smart diets, perhaps, if you, if you want to call them. Uh, I also believe that the Arab region should become uh, a global actor on the world's uh, food trade market, perhaps establishing a trader similar to what the Asian countries have done, Singapore and China currently and the United States, so establishing, let's call it, an Arab Cargill or an Arab um, Olam. Uh, and thirdly, it needs creative solutions, and uh, I'm not uh, as qualified as uh, Dr. Mohtar to talk about the creative solutions, because he mentioned them, looking at the green water space, looking at ways to really identify um, ways to uh, increase agricultural production under marginal conditions. And it's not only, I believe, you know, Dr. Mortar, but his leadership will certainly provide uh, loads of opportunities for the breadth of knowledge and skills and uh, in, the, in the faculty of uh, agriculture and food sciences to collaborate on, on those topics. What I also believe is that academia has also a civil society mission. And I think that uh, AUB in this region can, prov can be a beacon of change, if you want to call it that way. For example, bringing together various European, American, but also regional partners, Asian partners from East Asia, together to work on issues such as water and food security, to learn from other countries, to learn from, uh, and to also uh, provide or expand or uh, to, to transfer knowledge from AUB to other countries in the world that face water scarcity. I mean, I particularly think about Sub-Sahara Africa, and AUB has started uh, this course very well by um, offering scholarships to students from Sub-Sahara Africa. We're very, very proud to have now three students um, in, the, uh, in the food security program through the MasterCard Foundation. I think that's extraordinary. And, uh, we all benefit, not only, I think, the students, but also uh, uh, the, the teachers, uh, you know, the course instructors, that we have students from uh, East Africa on board, and we hope to expand this number in the next few years. Also to bring in, hopefully, more American students, other European students, to really work together and to show that AUB is one of the few universities in the world where you can study a topic which will define the 21st century, as water and food security, yeah. and it's actually a nice place to study it. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a place where you can uh, have a lot of fun as well as intellectual uh, inspiration and stimulation. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I'd like to ask uh, Rabia uh, to comment on um, two related points that haven't come up here a lot, but they're really like the big elephants in the room. One is political decision-making in the Arab world or maybe the absence of sufficient good political decision-making in the Arab world. And the other one is the role of the private sector. I've always been struck yeah. in my work around the Arab region as a reporter for many years, traveling around. I did work for UNICEF for many years, traveling all over the region, rural areas in Oman and, and Palestine and, and Syria and everywhere. And in the smallest village, you would find Pepsi-Cola and potato chips. 
every day available at very reasonable prices. So the enormous power of the private sector to not only reach every citizen in our countries, but to provide them with a range of food items that are not perhaps as nutritional as the, we would like our young people to consume. But this power of the private sector, uh, the money-making imperative uh, is so strong that is there a way that it can be harnessed, particularly if you look at the global trade figures that we were given before, how trade is going to be so important. So if we go to countries like, I don't know, India or China or Brazil or Turkey, and we know there's going to be massive food trade with them, to uh, give them incentives uh, to create a trade mechanism in food that is mutually beneficial and not just selling us soft drinks and potato chips. Uh, Rabia, do you have any comment on those two related factors? Absolutely. Thank you, Rami. You did read my mind. Um, Dr. Dagger pointed out a very important uh, uh, question that, okay, where do we move from here? Um, before I respond, I'd like to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to food security. The way we define food security is important, and the way I would like to define it, it's critical to health. Healthy human being, healthy society starts with healthy food and healthy food production system. So I would want to make sure to explicitly put in health at the core of the and nutrition at the core of how I define food security. So it's not only the calories and the and the production. It's also the nutritional value and how, and how it ties to uh, to human health. So, so that's what, one thing that I'd, I'd like to make sure that human health is at the core of uh, 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 of food security. In response to Dr. Daniel, uh, I will not be able to uh, explicitly uh, uh, mention all of the plan, but but I'd like to to, to state that the current status quo with the allocation model of water, food, in our region and globally, it doesn't, it's not going to carry us for the future sustainable system what we're talking about. And what I mean by the allocation model is that today, water is allocated to various sectors, and the agriculture sector, unfortunately, is the least productive in terms of the economic productivity. So we need to look at different models in which the model is beyond a zero-sum game. I agree with very much with Hadi in terms of the economics, but UAE is not the is not my model for moving forward. The model moving forward for a is a sustainable system where social, economic, and uh, environmental are at harmony. So we need to develop. We go. We need to go beyond the economics, and we need to to have a holistic system where a, a much more long-term sustainable system for the region. So we all know the insecurity of today's model. We need to create, based on our understanding of local knowledge, and I emphasize local, create synergies in which water and energy and food are synergistic to provide for the shortcoming in the food production system today. And I would emphasize that the role of the academia is to develop the system where to reduce, the, to reduce these interdependencies, improve the equity and the distribution of these resources. Technological solutions, social solutions, political and economic are levers for this new model. The players are absolutely agree with Rami, the private sector, the public sector, and civil society, where academia is the catalyst for that change in looking at this new model. The solutions I highlighted early on are parts of that plan. We need to develop holistic strategies for these interconnected systems to help us increase resilience and reduce interdependencies of water and food and develop solutions that are out of the box. Reduce these uh, uh, waste and increase the uh, uh, circular economy solutions that will benefit society as a whole. Private sector role is critical, and we need to engage local uh, private sector in addition to the mega supply chain companies. Thank you. We have a question um, that came in from the audience, um, which is about the situation in Yemen, which is literally uh, in the 
on the brink of famine and in the middle of a humanitarian crisis that's pretty unprecedented in the region. Something like 80% of the population uh, needs food assistance and, and water. Um, and there's maybe a million cholera cases that are going to be registered. So can this humanitarian crisis, which is the consequence of political actions by many different countries or inaction, can this crisis mobilize the political will possibly to address particularly the food dimension, the nutrition dimension of the crisis? Does anybody of our three uh, speakers have comments on that? The link between humanitarian crises and uh, moving forward on food security issues? Martin? Uh, <clears throat> I think Yemen is uh, a very tragic case, and I think uh, we can all, or we all agree that uh, uh, we pray that no uh, humanitarian crisis of uh, uh, unseen scale will occur in the next few months. I hope that we all hope that the, you know, the, the powers in the region will somehow find an agreement to uh, not only provide food to Yemenis, but also to find a way to um, achieve um, some peace agreement in, in Yemen. Um, I think humanitarian responses are, are one thing, and I think this, uh, that's, that's uh, something we at AUB, by the way, contribute to. AUB will, together with the International Food Policy Research Institute, uh, we're going to have a training course to Yemeni officials on, on food security and food security indicators. Uh, and rapid responses, uh, which will happen at some point in the next few months. Um, thanks to Rachel Barney, who's organized it and is doing very, very well, incredible work to, to bring uh, these Yemeni uh, officials to, to Lebanon. Uh, I think we're trying to, to contribute or play our part in this uh, dreadful conflict. I think academia can otherwise do very little. You know, at the end of the day, food is also part of the bigger politics. and. Uh, yeah, it's uh, sometimes very depressing. Okay, we can open Rabi. it. Yes, Rabia. Hi. Go ahead. I would add one dimension which is in our control. I mean, and, and, and the academics, uh, and what I would personally feel that what's under our control is how do we equip the local communities with technologies, with know how to cope with some of these insecurities. Unfortunately, we cannot change the, the global politics. There is a lot of at hand, and I think from my role in terms of uh, uh, as a scientist, as an as a incoming dean, I'd like to see more role to empowering local communities to become more resilient. Uh, and, and, and this can be done through uh, better local technologies, better local resilience to uh, their, their water supply, their food supply, and how they can cope not only with tragedies such as in Yemen, but with tragedy, with, with, with foreseen climate change issues and with the re re reduction in surface and groundwater water supply, how can we do more with less? And I think from my perspective, I'd like to emphasize that working with local governance uh, local communities and local decision making probably is a role that we can uh, uh, succeed in academia while the uh, uh, global politics may fail. Thank, Thank you. you. That, that, Thank raises, you. That, that, raises, that raises an issue. If I can just uh, quickly speak to the issue um, that was raised, the question with regards to Yemen and the ability of crisis to draw attention and political will to resolving some food security issues. I would say that um, there's two things. In the case of what happened uh, with the closure of the ports and drawing political, I mean, there very clearly was, a, was an international outcry that said you need to be able to bring in these resources to address immediate food security issues. To bring the food in because there's disruption to local production, therefore not enough need. So I think kind of in the short-term humanitarian grounds that was presumably at least the attention there was a positive sign. Whether or not that will maintain is a different question. But one of the things I think we've seen and we've learned from a lot of the experience that um, 
of what's been happening here in Lebanon with regards to the Syrian crisis is that food security is increasingly being seen as sort of a part of a continuum. There are immediate humanitarian needs that need to be met, and that extends over a longer-term development frame. And so you see that in terms of the programming that's happening in Lebanon for both Syrian refugees who are registered in Lebanon, as well as the Lebanese host community, of longer-term efforts that are more around providing folks with alternative livelihoods or income streams and not necessarily on the receipt of the debit card or the cash card. And I would say in terms of what role academia can play there, we do have colleagues who are very much working in partnership with NGOs, Action Against Hunger, the World Food Program, and others in terms of agricultural or nutrition-oriented projects. Those, I think, have been where the bulk of the work has been through maybe the community kitchens um, or urban agriculture, but I'm sure there's other things that I'm missing out on. Um, so in terms of what we're doing, unfortunately, yes, the bulk of it is probably right now on the teaching and the research, but I think there are particular projects where the, where the role of academia has also been, to some extent to inform interventions. Thank you, Rachel. I, I think this question that Rabia mentioned, which also Martin mentioned earlier, and, and, and Rachel in her research overview, that is going to loom huge in the region and has already, is this uh, one of the biggest shifts in the Arab world in our generation in the last 30, 40 years has been the slow migration of rural communities and mid-sized towns into the big urban centers. Uh, often it's due to agricultural failures, often it's due to uh, political, uh, sectarian, commercial incentives, other things. Um, and, and one of the big challenges is how to address the, the ability of rural and small town communities to actually maintain their level of well-being uh, at whatever level they are, not to deteriorate uh, further. And of course, one of the drivers we now know of the Arab uprisings was hundreds of thousands of unemployed uh, and pretty helpless and hopeless young men who had come into the cities from rural areas in countries like Syria, uh, like um, Morocco and, and other countries uh, who just came into the big cities because they couldn't survive in the rural areas anymore, whether it was because of poor agricultural and water management policies, and climate change, or or other issues. So this this topic of the integrity and well-being of rural and small town communities really is one that uh, is urgent in our region and probably needs to be addressed by academic communities like AUB and, and others and this is possibly a topic we may deal with one day in, in our series here. I'd like to open up to anybody here in New York who has questions. Damien, and introduce yourself. Yes, sure. I'm Damien Caldona from the Department of Public Information of the United Nations across the street, as the colleague said. Although I am based in Dakar, I'm the director there for West Africa. So we deal with communication and public information. I just have two or three points that I would like to share more than questions. One is that the first thing is how difficult it is to communicate food and security. I mean, it's not at all uh, an easy thing to communicate. Unless you have a huge humanitarian crisis, uh, as the one that we'll probably have in Yemen very soon. We already have it in some regions of Yemen, by the way. Uh, so it's, this is a, is a big challenge for all of us. For the, also, there's another element that I think is extremely important. You, we always talk about the, the water, the food, um, and then also the dependency uh, issue. But I think... For a political point of view, the dependency also leads to subordination. So I think this whole issue of how it will affect all this uh, eventually, you know, if countries really have to rely completely in external um, food supply, how can this create or be even a more give more fuel to to, to conflicts that we are all witnessing? Uh, just to, to add some good news at least on, on Rami's question. Uh, <laughs> on Rami's question about the private sector, which I think is essential. I would say that since uh, last year, when the Brazilian uh, diplomat Graciano took over the FAO as director general, he has really engaged in a very, very, very high level talk with the big uh, companies uh, around the world. So, and also uh, the Global Compact, I don't know if you are aware of what the Global Compact is, it's kind of a, it's not the UN, but it's very, very close to us, is the is an association of companies that are somehow linked to the purposes of the United Nations. So, and they are just two blocks from here. 
and they have created also a, a, a group on food security. So all the companies, all the, the companies that are members of the Global Compact that deal with food are now thinking on these issues, which is, which is I think, uh, extremely, extremely important. So, I mean, there was just a couple of comments to, to share. Yeah. Thank you for those. Thank, thank you for, thank you for, thank you for, for being with us. <laughs> Any other comments? Questions? Um, I would like to just uh, highlight a point in response to what has been raised. Uh, this is Hadi Jafar again from Beirut. Um, I, I think what uh, what Dr. Mahtar has mentioned is, is extremely important and um, the strengthening uh, the resilience of local communities. And I, um, I know that the Food and Agricultural Organization has uh, recently um, uh, launch, is launching a big campaign, um, not sure if campaign is the right word, but a big initiative on uh, what is called agroecology. Uh, and this will uh, focus on decreasing the dependencies of the local communities, the local farmers, on external inputs given that the Green Revolution did not uh, succeed in ending hunger in the world and especially in, in our region. So with, with agroecology uh, introducing, um, for example, good water management practices at the farm level, uh, using the res resilient farming systems that our ancestors have, have used for thousands of years and they have thrived uh, on for their livelihoods, uh, building on existing agroecological systems from Morocco to Tunisia to Sudan um, to Lebanon and Syria, um, using this local and indigenous knowledge uh, to uh, produce a modern agroecological approach mm -hmm. given uh, the recent scientific advances in the field of agriculture, moving from a less conventional uh, agricultural system of production which, um, which is heavily uh, reliant on external inputs to a more um, uh, natural, socio-economic and environmental agricultural production system that incorporates uh, local inputs. So, um, so I think this, is, um, um, this uh, kind of uh, initiative can be strengthened uh, given our role as agricultural engineers, our role in the region as the, world, as the first university to provide an agricultural program, um, we have a big responsibility on uh, relaying this message to farmers, to uh, small producers in the region um, for training, for extension, and, and other uh, community development um, uh, trials. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions from uh, from Beirut before we turn it over to Martin for his closing comment? Yes. Yes. Um, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Shukri, and I'm a scholar at AUB. Uh, I have two questions that are all related to water, which is a very important element when it comes to food security. Uh, my first question is the notion of hegemony, as we know um, that plays important role when it comes to countries and how they share uh, water resources. So how can uh, be harmonized uh, water use when it comes to upstream countries and downstream countries? Uh, the other question I have is uh, how can we unpack the uh, dominant narratives when it comes to water and water scarcity and in the equation of uh, export, import, uh, footprint water? Because as we know, uh, Lebanon is uh, one of these countries uh, that has uh, water scarce, but also uh, they export a lot of vegetables and fruits to the Gulf that uh, mainly uh, is component of a lot of water. So how can uh, be balanced uh, uh, between countries such that they know uh, they are also food, uh, food insecure and they depend on food, but at the same time they are exporting a lot of their natural resource water, which they can use in food security in their own country. Thank you. Martin, do you want to make a 
answer that and make a closing comment? Yes, please. Um, well, thank you, Shukri, for two very important and interesting questions. First of all, I think in Germany, well, what we need is uh, international law, we need legal agreements, we need the United Nations, we need people here in New York as well as in Geneva and Beirut, from UN experts who really bring countries together and establish frameworks that are based on the rule of law, and that's the most important thing. Um, our friend from uh, Western Africa, from the UN, agrees, which is also great. <laughs> um, in, in, in terms of food trade, well, of course, water will be exported and imported, and, 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 and well, trade is not bad. Trade is important. You know, people need to also make forex, you know, foreign exchange. So it's not that uh, Lebanon shouldn't uh, export its vegetables to the Gulf. Why not? If they pay for it. Uh, the question is, uh, to what extent is, you know, what are the opportunity costs of water? Similar uh, issue what, what Hadi uh, raised earlier on. Um, I think what is also important, and, and this week I, I had the opportunity to go to California to meet those new companies that produce meat, uh, which is vegetable based, or uh, sometimes they think they can do uh, lab uh, meat. I don't think it's so easy to do, but uh, there are ways or there are new innovations that need to be embraced. And I think Lebanon is uh, the most innovative country in the Arab world, which is again, providing AUB with a unique space and opportunity to embrace new ideas. Why not? Also producing uh, plant-based proteins, you know, similar things as they do here. You know, you have suddenly a meat patty, which looks like a meat patty. It smells like a meat patty. It tastes like a meat patty. <laughs> However, there was no cow being slaughtered <laughs> for it. And that's interesting, I think. And it uses less water, just 1% or 5% of the water that uh, the cows need in order to uh, be uh, turned into meat. So there are ways, and I think uh, it's about creativity, and I think it, it's, a, it's about um, you know, embracing the future. And once again, I think the uh, faculty, the entire faculty in Beirut is ideally placed, and the new leadership under Dr. Mokhtar uh, will facilitate a lot of those opportunities. Um, to collaborate and to understand that food security is an opportunity, not necessarily a threat only. It's an opportunity to uh, work together, to collaborate, to trade, and to identify innovations, not only uh, technological innovations, but also social innovations, economic innovations, by bringing in the private sector, bringing in the uh, immense skills, what we see on campus of the young generation in uh, in, in uh, not only Lebanon, but uh, you know, around the Arab region. I think this is the great opportunity, and um, yeah, let's face the future, and let's not be scared, because I think we uh, have everything it needs uh, to uh, solve this issue in the next few years. Thank you very much.